Khan, and today uh, we're going to be, uh, along with Michael Wozniki, our project engineer from Lumicon, we're going to be co-hosting uh, today a, uh, our third installment of our question and answer with industry experts. So we appreciate you attending today and uh, dropping in. A couple of housekeeping items real quick before we make introductions, and that is that, uh, as you can see, there's a chat section uh, on your Zoom there. So if you want to chime in or if you want to um, ask a question about the subject that's being discussed, please place your question there or you can put it into the question and answer um, section as well. So there's two ways to, to log in. We will be posting the current question we're talking about to the chat section. So in case you um, want to know what, we, what the discussion is. If you leave for a second and come back, then you'll know what we're discussing at the time. Um, other than that, uh, we're going to get, we're going to get going. So Don, if you want to go ahead. Um, <clears throat> and we will begin with introductions. So our first expert is uh, Brianne Wilcock. She's from the Illuminating Engineering Society. She is the education manager uh, for IES. So um, in this role, she develops and maintains the IES education programs and activities, including the new e-learning portal. Uh, prior to that, Brianne spent about 10 years as an architectural lighting designer, and she was one of Lighting Magazine's International 40 Under 40 in 2017. She was a past president of the Detroit IES section from 2013 to 2015. And Brianne teaches lighting and environmental systems at Henry Ford College. Welcome, Brianne. You're on mute, but that's okay. So. All right, next up, I'd like to introduce Tom Barnes, ALP Vice President and Business Manager with Lexalite Brands. Tom has a Bachelor of Science degree in Plastics Engineering Technology from Ferris State College. After graduating in 1985, he promptly joined and spent his entire 34-year professional career at Lexalite, the brand of ALP lighting components. Tom started as a sales engineer and is presently vice president and business unit manager for optical products. Tom previously served on the IES industrial lighting and office lighting committees. Tom's been awarded four patents relating to the use of plastics in lighting applications. Welcome, Tom. Thank you, Michael. Next, we'd like to introduce Corey Pellin. Uh, Corey is from Samsung. He's the regional sales manager. Um, he's responsible for the general lighting and automotive markets in the Midwest. Corey has 12 years of experience in solid state lighting. And prior to joining Samsung in 2018, has held management positions at Sharp, Cree, and ERP Power. Welcome, Corey. Good afternoon, everybody. And returning on our panel again this time is Amea Shortria with Signify, an applications manager. An electrical engineer by trade, Amea has worked with Signify, formerly Philips Lighting, in various roles in the LED electronics space as a senior product development engineer, product manager, and most recently managed the applications and design in team. He enjoys working with, guiding, mentoring colleagues and other lighting professionals through their projects, queries, and collaborating to bring meaningful propositions to life. Having been a part of LED systems since the early days has allowed him to experience the evolution of LEDs into the mainstream. Welcome back, Amea. Hey, thanks, Michael and Don, for having me. Uh, last but not certainly not least, uh, we would like to welcome Don Lincoln. Uh, Don is the Lumicon Senior Vice President. Don oversees product development, engineering, manufacturing, and has been with Lumicon for 12 years working in the LED field. Don has also a background as a metallurgist, materials and castings engineer with General Motors powertrain division for eight years. Uh, there he performed failure analysis on aluminum, steel, and iron automotive parts. Don was the laboratory manager of GM's crash test laboratory in Milford for also for four years. Welcome, Don. Thank you. All right, Michael, go ahead. And we're going to start off with our first question. This will be directed to all panelists. This is very wide reaching and also, of course, pretty timely. First question is, everybody, how has COVID-19 affected the LED lighting industry from a manufacturer's perspective? Uh, 
All right, well, this is Tom, I'll jump in there. Um, so we've certainly seen a decrease in near-term backlog. Uh, I think the major impact of that has been that uh, some of our bigger customers have partially shut down facilities or completely shut down facilities. Uh, and certainly a good chunk of that is the uh, real big slowdown in the near term here of the construction industry. So we've seen a, we've probably seen a 30% reduction in backlog over the last two months. So it's, it's taken a toll there on, uh, on that side of it. On the plus side, we really have had no supply interruptions. We're able to get all the materials that we need to operate the business. So we're, we are basically ready and raring to go when things turn back around. I think from our side, uh, we're just now starting to see some supply interruptions with components. Um, this is stuff that I think was kind of uh, up until this point, we were maybe pulling components from our suppliers uh, stock. And now we're starting to see some of that drain away and getting longer lead times on things like LEDs and power supplies. Uh, kind of fallout from earlier plant closings, maybe closings that were in effect a month or so ago. Uh, that's now just starting to catch up to us. Uh, we've heard uh, that there's a huge shipping backlog coming out of Asia. So uh, boat space and, and plane space are at a premium right now. We're seeing shipping rates go up, trying to get LEDs or other components uh, out of Asia. Um, there's some uh, closer plant closings or recent plant closings that are affecting us out of uh, Mexico and, uh, and even domestically. But uh, for the most part, uh, everything is still flowing uh, on the fixture manufacturing side for the most part. Corey, what about LEDs? Yeah, from our standpoint, uh, to echo Tom's uh, comments here, our backlog is down a little bit. Not terrible, but it's, it's down a little bit. Um, as I mentioned on the previous um, conference we had, um, we're seeing air shipping costs specifically being two or three times what they normally cost. So we're, we've so far been pretty good about being able to absorb those, but if this continues much longer, we may have to start uh, passing some of those on uh, to some of our customers, sharing those costs. Vessel shipments, thankfully, haven't been an issue. Um, and I guess the other good thing is we haven't seen any major pushouts on any jobs yet. We've seen a few minor pushouts, people a little getting having a little trepidation about uh, you know moving forward with some things, but really nothing nothing significant and thankfully at least in the midwest the area that i'm responsible for is almost every lighting company is deemed an essential business and they're continuing more or less at you know three quarters to full speed in their in their respective factories great amaya what about uh power supplies and yeah, I think it's it's pretty similar to what Don, Corey, and uh, Tom talked about. Um, most of the backlog has been kind of weaning a little bit now. Um, the supplies out of China are coming back, but of course now the emphasis is on the shipping part, uh, the backlog through shipping. Uh, but yeah, the impact was uh, definitely there, but uh, maybe I would say not as severe or deeper as imagined in the beginning. Great. Um, what about psychologically? Is there as a lot of, is everybody working from home? Um, I know the production plants, obviously people have to be physically there, but Brianne, you were telling me that IES is all working remotely. Is that correct? We are. I mean, the IES headquarters is based in Manhattan. So although I'm in Michigan, they, um, there are seven of us, I think that are remote. The Manhattan office has extra, you know, things to be concerned about, not the least of which is that the prevalence of um, the virus in the city, but also public transit and a lot of other risks um, that those of us who might commute individually in a car don't don't have. So um, it, from a shift perspective, I mean, I, I've seen some peers say, especially the sales teams and that kind of thing, members of IES, that they're struggling a little bit with trying to be patient working from home, especially the sales team that have you know, a great new luminaire and really want to get in front of people, they're not able to to do that right now. So I think that shift has felt pretty hard um, now that it's been so many weeks. But manufacturers have been extremely supportive of the IES. 
we the people who support us year round in terms of membership and sustaining membership and general support for education or activities we haven't seen any lull in that so we're very fortunate in that way gotcha all right we're going to move on to the next question uh it's kind of a two-parter so one second um put it over here for you So uh, what do you expect for the U.S. lighting fixture business looking at the 2021 calendar year? Um, and then part A to that is what do you see being the biggest growth area in lighting in a down market? I, I mean, I could start, I guess the, I'm not in the fixture business, right? I'm, but I've been on the design side and now, um, spend quite a bit of time with fixture manufacturers. Um, but my colleagues that I've worked with in the past, uh, we just got together last week and they were saying that higher ed jobs and some other things have come to almost a screeching halt while other things haven't had any lull. So I think 2021 will be a lot of the projects that have survived this, like the budget for the project, or maybe they were mid construction, all the projects that are kind of either in process or still slated to go as as per um, originally intended. There'll be a lot of adaptation for budgets and workflow, I think. I think not only from a timeline perspective, but from a, um, the choices they make in luminaires will probably be more driven by cost and by just whatever adaptations they have to make. Uh, I'll be curious to see if there's an increase for well building um, luminaires that meet the well building criteria as we're learning more about how our architectural environments can help or hurt in a time of somebody having a common cold or otherwise. Um, and what off open offices look like in 2021, um, whether there'll be more construction for private offices or how the workflow will go. I mean, I think um, there's some uh, organizations and, and companies and, um, and property managers that in these uh, economic downturns may look at opportunities for energy savings um, and prioritize some of those projects. So just because, you know, the financials are, aren't looking so good, it is an opportunity to save money long term. And I think, you know, we've seen in the past that that uh, you know, certain projects uh, get green lighted that maybe they wouldn't have before just because of the potential for energy saving, especially if you have that combination of an economic downturn and high energy costs, which we're not necessarily in right now. But if that combination happens, then uh, you know, that could actually be good for, for lighting manufacturers. Yeah, I think I also kind of agree with what Don said, uh, because we see a lot of the early adopters back in the early days of LEDs, they see a tremendous energy savings and almost a economic benefit to switching to newer light sources. So going through a refurbishment or a cycle for that. Um, so of course, while the discretionary spending will be limited for obvious reasons, uh, there is some potential also for those type of applications. You know, I haven't checked in a long time, but, it, you know, the Department of Energy used to kind of track or estimate, I guess, the number of lighting fixtures out in the, in the country or in the world or whatever that still had yet to be converted from HID or fluorescent or other sources. And, you know, as of like a year ago, we were still looking at well over 50% of the fixtures still in operation um, are older technologies. So, you know, that, that's still an opportunity, regardless of uh, the economics that, that you're experiencing. Don and Amaya, question for you, I guess, to add on to what you're saying. Do you think that there'll be an increase in energy usage because shift work may change or overnight sanitation issues? So for a lot of facilities they're facing, maybe having an overnight crew that's a cleaning crew that might be a new energy uh, use for them. Do you think there'll be an increase in, in the way that facilities have to kind of shift the resources from the daytime work to the I'm sure we're going to see 
a lot of usage patterns change, uh, not only because of that, you know, you are going to have, I think, an increase in offset shifts. So companies that maybe only had one shift before may have two now because they're going to alternate production workers. Yeah. Uh, also, office usage. I don't, you know, you, you read stories in the, uh, in the news and everything about, you know, companies like Twitter that are saying, you know what, I don't think we're ever coming back. So a lot of their office workforce is going to stay remote uh, indefinitely. So that's going to shake up energy usage in office spaces for sure. So uh, it'll be interesting to see how, how things kind of shape up out of this. Uh, locally here, uh, the West Bloomfield School District has actually floated their proposal already for fall. And their proposal is that half of the school district is going to go on Monday and Tuesday to classes. The other half of the school district will go to class on Thursday, Friday, and then the uh, Wednesday, Thursday, and then the days you're off, you'll be online learning. But the Wednesdays are going to be left open for a deep clean of all the schools so that between the shifts, they'll be cleaning the, the entire schools. And that, that'll take 30 cla 30 person classrooms down to 15 and then put the rest onto online. So, um, but they did cite in the article that they believe that it's going to almost, uh, you know, put about 25 to 30% higher budget to try to orchestrate all of that. So there can be definitely some increased costs. So anybody else want to chime in on the, what you think about 2021 or selling in a down market? Uh, what, what do you see the, what do you see as an opportunity in a down market other than just energy savings? This is Tom, I'll jump in. Um, and I'll qualify anything I say by saying, I think I got a C minus in macroeconomics. So mm -hmm. you don't, wanna, don't wanna label me a, a, an expert on this one by any means, but um, amazing amount of change going on in the world. And I'm, it's way beyond me to understand the implications of, I think we're talking about adding $5 trillion to the national debt here by pumping money into the economy. And, uh, uh, and a, a, bill, or a trillion of that is going to be for infrastructure. So uh, I'd say that outdoor lighting, things that are related to roads, bridges, highways, um, anything along those lines, uh, assuming that that passes is going to be, you know, a real economic boom for that portion of the business. So I, I see outdoor being a, an area of opportunity. <clears throat> also, I think June 1st here, the uh, USMCA, that's the, the new version of NAFTA kicks in. And, uh, and that puts some teeth into North American content for anything that's coming into the U.S. from either Canada or from Mexico, a lot of it obviously from Mexico, that um, there's a penalty now. If, if you bring it in from Mexico and most of the content is from Asia, there's an economic penalty. We're seeing large OEMs starting to look at that and say, wow, um, our cost just went up dramatically to import components from there. So. I see a number of things taking place that look like positives. How is that going to balance out against some of the things that were just mentioned about? Uh, will, uh, will anybody ever go back to, will, will the bulk of us go back to going into an office environment? Will people spend money on office lighting? Uh, it's, a, it's a really interesting scenario there. My daughter's like, works for an all uh, software company that their entire business is just people at keyboards and uh, they're already talking about, well, not coming back till July at least, and then why come back? Actually, their productivity shows it's higher. They're, they're struggling to understand why they need a permanent office of the size they have. It makes me wonder with that many people working from home, what our role, like as the IES or other, other even local utilities, what the role will be of seeing your energy bill go up at home. I mean, you have all these people working from home and what what will the trade-off be? Will people want to learn a little bit more about their lighting systems, their computers, lighting controls or other controls for HVAC? I, I'm curious to see how some of this shakes down, especially as air conditioners start to run soon. Um, a little different, it's when the issue is a little closer to home or literally in this case at home, I wonder if that will impact education at all. We may have a bigger job to do in the nearer future. 
I actually work out of home full time. So this is not a change for me. But one of the things that I see coming down the pike is uh, in the residential space is that since I do work out from home, I have a lot of uh, people that are interested in my ergonomic position. Do I have a stand up desk? Do I have a comfortable chair? I think maybe lighting may also end up or could be also added to those type of home office requirements. Um, so maybe possibly residential applications and and uh, other opportunities like that going forward for the workforce who's going to end up working from home quite a bit more, I think, after this is all said and done. Great, thanks. Appreciate that. All right, we're going to head over to the third question. This is going to be directed at Brienne. When, uh, of course, she's done, anyone else is interested to chime in, they're welcome to do that. Has UVA and UVB been studied, and why isn't that talked about as much as UVC? And further, why does it seem the focus is an upper room for an interior environment and duct lighting rather than putting this technology in more common uh, other luminaires? Oy, okay, so <laughs> for those of you unfamiliar, um, UVA, UVB, and UVC uh, refer to a specific range of lighting, the UV spectrum, we, you probably know it more for the fact that you might need sunscreen for it. Um, lately, there's been a lot in the media about UV lighting. Some um, sales opportunists have taken advantage of what people know or don't know about UV lighting um, for usage at home in terms of disinfection and that kind of thing. When it comes to those three, which are just a difference in the specific nanometer range, so what what um, nanometer band uh, does that cover, UVC being the 200 to 280 range. UVC has been in the news a lot on the IES side or in the lighting side because it has proven effective to deactivate uh, the coronavirus. So um, for those of you kind of catching up with terminology, a virus can be active or inactive. Um, it's not dead or alive, so it's, we don't use the term to kill a virus. Um, there are other things, it's been other germs and bacteria and other things that have been studied in the UV sort of realm. Um, but the, the two biggest factors are how much light and what kind of it, whether it's UVC, UVB or UVA, and then for how long, which is called a fluency rate, so dosage over time. And we're balancing those, the experts in the world are balancing that out and, and have been informing us all. So the IES hosted a four hour um, webinar about it. There's a great, and actually I can put it in the chat, back, chat box for everybody. Um, there's a great IES link that has frequently asked questions about UV lighting in case you wanna dig a little deeper. Um, I think in terms of the second part of the question, when it gets into the application of it. So UV lighting in the commercial environment, UVC lighting specifically, we'll stick with the UVC uh, range since that's what we talk about in terms of the coronavirus. It's been discussed that there's some upper room. In other words, it's in the room that you're in. It's just a, a, mounted high on the uh, wall and it's meant to, um, deactivate the virus from a certain height. I think it's seven feet, but don't quote me on that. And uh, and above in the room, so that the circulating air, um, there's a reduction of the virus in circulating air. It's also been talked about in duct lighting or or in HVAC. In other words, you don't see it, but it's treating your HVAC system to help with uh, airflow and the virus prevalence in that or the the prevalency of the virus in that. So. There's a lot of really, really great information. Um, the Photobiology Committee for IES, the IES doesn't test anything. We're, we're the, on the kind of uh, organizers and nonprofit side, <laughs> but we have a Photobiology Committee and they are the experts and that committee has done a really, really great job and, and been very generous with their time to put together the four hour conference we had plus um, the, the frequently asked questions page. And so the IES is kind of a, a facilitator. Um, we disseminate as best we can, but it's a interesting topic. There will be opportunists for sure, but before anybody dives in, it would be really smart to uh, do a little bit more research. I'm afraid that I've had a few friends say, I bought this UV light. Do you think it's going to work? And uh, I'm afraid not, but, and 
the last thing I'll say is having a, a good understanding of that is um, really a fascinating topic if you're interested in lighting because now what we consider this tool for well-being and how we kind of interact with our environment actually has a few extra layers in terms of our health now but UV lighting is uh, not great for your skin. <laughs> uh, so um, please do your research and uh, there's a reason we wear sunscreen outside. So, but I, I put the, in the chat box, I put the link to the frequently asked questions page. It's really, really helpful if this is a new topic to you. Great, thank you for that link. Uh, related to that, we just had another question that came in from Peggy here in Michigan asking if you're familiar with FAR UV. Oh, I'm not. I'm not familiar with the phrase. Doesn't mean that the concept hasn't come across my my desk here. I'm certainly doing the best I can to stay informed, but um, I haven't. I don't recall that coming up in the previous four-hour session we had with Guy. Uh, yes, uh, about a week and a half ago. Yeah, there's some far LED, excuse me, far UV solutions out there, like 200 man nanometers and shorter wavelengths than that, and it's supposed to have much higher photon energy than UVC and much more efficient, but that's the extent of, that I know about it right now. There's so, so there are, I think, a couple of companies that are promoting solutions, but I really don't know a heck of a lot of, about them right now. Yeah, we, we have a long way to go in terms of education of what, what lighting, UV lighting in general, UVA, UVB, UVC, does to our skin and the commercial environment, which, you know, a lot of our finishes in the commercial environment get tested, right, for their durability and for their exposure and how fast they fade with daylight and that kind of thing. And so hopefully there's going to be kind of a surge of education for how to apply it correctly, where to apply it, and then what it might do to the materials in the environment, what to consider about your ceiling finishes, things like that, if, if you did cho choose to go that route, like a hospital room or, or a sort of a high-risk environment. I won't be using it at home anytime soon for what it's worth. <laughs> uh, to add on to that, um, uh, another adjunct question is that um, are LEDs the best source for UVC as we stand right now? Maybe Corey or Don, you, maybe you guys could lend to that because I know high pressure sodium is still a very good source and, and some other lamp types uh, as far as producing UVC. Yeah, I think the, the previous lamp source was a mercury source prior to LEDs. Um, my understanding was that the uh, spectrum produced uh, from those mercury sources really wasn't ideal for viruses. It was close. Um, I think I want to say it was uh, maybe in the upper 270s or something like that. And uh, it was effective against viruses, maybe a little longer dosage time or something like that to be effective. But uh, what you get with LEDs is you really can prescribe the exact wavelength that you're targeting uh, for UVC. So I think they're a lot more efficient in that regard. Um, you know, uh, you can, um, you know, put the uh, put the, the beam, so to speak, right where you want it. So if you're doing surface disinfection, it, it helps. Uh, point the, the beam in the right direction. So I think from that standpoint, it's a lot more efficient than the older technologies. Yep, I agree. The, basically, it would echo Don's comments exactly. Yeah, LED is probably the best source for it today that we have. Lamps are just too big, uh, too expensive, too cumbersome, so. Okay. Uh, we're going to move on uh, to even um, a, uh, a better question. Um, not a better question, just, a, just this one's a little bit more controversial. Um, <clears throat> so uh, well, let's stop for one second. We just received a question, and um, they're asking about um, what about UVA and B in disinfection of counters and tables? Uh, manufacturers are producing luminaires for ceiling mounts. Um, does anybody want to speak on that real quick? So the, the, the link I sent out to everybody covers UVA and UVB um, in specific chunks of information. And there are actually lamps for UVA and UVB and that they can be 
um, in different form factors. But again, there are risks involved with using UVA and UVB lighting, just like there is with UVC. So, and by risk, I mean to us um, and our skin. In terms of the common luminaire, um, a lot of people ask the question, well, why isn't it in a, in a patient light above a bed? Well, that's because either purposeful or accidental exposure to that type of light for your skin is not going to work. So, um, in brevity. So, the link I sent has some, I'm not an expert in UVA and UVB lamps specifically, but the link I sent has some great breakdowns of um, for, directly from the photobiology committee, which is a uh, um, important because it's a consensus group. So that means they have to, to reach um, consensus so that they can relay information that they've agreed upon, which means it's not coming from one manufacturer says their UVA lamp does this. One manufacturer says their UVB lamp does this. I would highly recommend looking at information from those as experts specifically for that reason. The okay. upshot is you would have a really nice tan as a patient. If you're, if you're a patient. Yeah, <laughs> I guess. All right, thank you very much for that. Um, our next question is, as utility rebates are reduced for LEDs, will DLC lose its sway over fixture specification. <clears throat> Who wants to jump on that one? Well, I think uh, uh, as the one that has to directly interface with DLC on an almost daily basis, uh, it seems pretty clear to me with the latest releases of 5.0 and 5.1 that DLC is making the leap from purely uh, kind of qualifying products strictly for energy savings, and they're really focusing on, um, for lack of a better phrase, picking winners and losers when it comes to quality. So they're really trying to drive quality into the fixture manufacturing business um, because they're, you know, they're starting to get into things like color quality and uh, beam control uh, by specifying glare metrics for certain applications. And, um, not that any of that is bad. It's certainly, I think, needed. Uh, we've all seen some pretty horrific lighting that's been deployed in, in, uh, in the field. But, uh, you know, I think moving beyond utility rebates, DLC kind of wants to be the, you know, if your product is on their QPL, then uh, that's just another tool for specifiers to say this is, this is a good quality product, has a good warranty. Um, it, you know, meets certain criteria for energy efficiency and, and color quality. So, yeah, I think they're definitely moving out of the realm of utility rebates and, and into, you know, solidly in the realm of, of fixture quality. And part of the danger of that is they're kind of prescribing what everybody is going to build. And it, and it takes a little bit of the magic out of creating an LED fixture, to be honest with you, if everybody is producing uh, a low bay that, you know, only has 15% light or whatever in the 60 to 80 degree zones, you know, my light's going to look just like the next guy's light and there's going to be absolutely no difference between them. So, you know, maybe for the buyer that becomes a good thing, um, but uh, it, it certainly narrows uh, what we can do as a, as a fixture manufacturer. Yeah, maybe to tag on to what Don said, um, the the other side or the other side of the coin there is also it helps to differentiate versus uh, products coming from overseas right so it helps us kind of create this uh, requirement for certain products that are more specific to the U.S. market as opposed to generally flooding uh, Asian imports. Um, maybe one other segue to the DLC discussion is also the DLC controls or network lighting. Mm -hmm. uh, which is, an, I think, a pretty positive push from their side uh, to standardize on um, the, the use cases and, and the functionality that's delivered as part of network lighting controls, uh, which definitely will bring about a good um, emergence of sort of that critical mass of feature sets for network lighting. This is Tom. I'll throw in a few comments there. Um, so Don, Don mentioned, you know, that they may go uh, with starting to prescribe quality, but um, by by going more into the light distribution side of it. But you know, the 
that they've already done some of those things by prescribing how much light can be at certain angles. And, uh, and I think what they're doing is taking out the role of the, uh, you know, of the lighting designer. They're, they're making cookie cutter uh, kind of uh, recommendations that say, hey, all high bays should be like this. And, you know, do they take into account surface reflectances in the room? Do they take into account room cavity ratio? Um, you know, every, uh, what, what is the height of the, uh, of the, the racks in the aisleways? There's a whole bunch of things to be taken into account whenever you do a lighting design. And I think one of the big problems we've had with DLC is they've, they've basically made it so, hey, if you want money, meet these requirements regardless of whether or not that's good lighting or bad lighting. And I don't believe that anything I've seen from DLC yet, I admit to being a DLC skeptic, is I don't think those guys are the experts in lighting and would much prefer to see uh, people using IES recommended practices for lighting an area than saying, hey, I met the, I checked the box that uh, the DLC made me check to be able to get here. I, um, I had my own personal wish and waved my magic wand. I, I don't think we have a place for DLC anymore because I don't think we're the wild west of uh, lighting. You know, I don't think LEDs are where they were 10 years ago when nobody had a clue if anything was good. I think market forces now can can manage what's going on in the in the marketplace. If you make a good quality LED and you stand behind it, then there you go. That's my two cents. Tom, I mean, as a former lighting designer, I'm I uh, echo some of your sentiment about the lack of awareness or education or control over the actual environment itself. Um, if you had lots of specular surfaces or a black ceiling, it really doesn't matter. I mean, it, it, it does matter, but the luminaire choice is only a part, a small part of the bigger picture. But I, I think for those people who already lean on it as a first level filter or even as their only filter because they don't hire a lighting designer, they don't maybe know enough to bother, um, maybe it's not in their budget to hire somebody, I really doubt that if the utilities rebate, I doubt that that will shift the adoption of, of, of a DLC spec very much. I think for the people who are already comfortable with it, they'll probably kind of uh, go forward under that comfort level. We do see, uh, you know, municipalities and other organizations that produce specifications that require DLC, they don't even understand what it means, but to them, it's some minimal threshold of quality and if they throw that in their spec they you know think that they're probably getting a good product even if they're not going after rebates or anything like that so we have seen it i guess you could say abused a little bit where you know maybe in place of knowledge you're putting three letters in your specification you know just requiring dlc and hoping for the best on the on the result. I mean, I always looked at it as a third party verification, like there's a third party involved in, in what I'm being told by this website or cut sheet. Um, so if you claim this many lumens for a watt, then, then there's some stop gap of information. And early on, I, I did a lot of work for General Motors. And what was happening was that across when we were doing a spec across lots of facilities, it was hard. It was hard to do a data deep dive to make sure that people were just telling the truth about their luminaires or, or doing their best. And so there was a lot of inconsistencies. But to Tom's point about being in the Wild West, we're not um, there as much as we used to be. Uh, I, I still think it has its place for people who need some something to lean on um, and don't have the resources for one way, reason or another to a lighting center or educated electrical engineer. I mean, the people who apply lighting uh, intelligently, I guess. I think it's important to point out too that, you know, the companies that uh, maybe were a little dishonest with their data, DLC really hasn't cleaned that up uh, as much. You can still, you know, if a company's gonna cheat the data, they can still cheat the data. It really hasn't policed that very well. Um, and, uh, you know, that's something we fight all the time. Yeah, that's good perspective, Don, from the manufacturer side. I, I can appreciate that. Um, there's a question. Do you think DLC is encro encroaching on IES's territory and vice versa? Oh, I'm guessing that's for me. <laughs> um, you know, 
even as a, okay, so I spent 10 years as a lighting designer. And even in that role, I mean, IES recommendations were a part of my toolkit. And uh, instinct was another uh, part of my toolkit. And so was some um, relationship or trust in learning about different finishes, which are not a lighting issue until it's all installed, right? But they're, they're, um, I don't think they're encroaching. I think that the IES works to educate people about uh, a minimum standard of care or even a recommended standard of care, right? We have a couple different thresholds in IES for lighting recommendations versus um, kind of quality control. Um, the IES seeks to, to bring people together in that way, to, to learn more about the application, the, the needs of the application, and then essentially to recommend um, some approach. But the, IS remains agnostic in terms of manufacturers. So there isn't any recommendation one way or the other that we can say, well, if you wanted to spec a quality LED replacement A19 lamp, here's how we would do it. We're not gonna, we're not gonna dig that deep. So I'd like to think that the IS is on more of the application quality side and DLC is more on the lo specific luminaire widget side. Um, but I, I suppose I, I can see why somebody would ask that question. Okay, Michael. Thanks. All right, we're gonna head over to the next question. This is gonna be initially directed at Amea. And the question is, when will driver manufacturers raise the bar to be as robust as an electronic fluorescent ballast or an HID ballast against surge or brownout situations? In 10 to 15 years after LEDs have been introduced, we're still dealing with an ill-tempered solution within an old power grid world. Amea. Yep. Thanks, Michael. And I think it's it's really a fascinating question, right? Uh, the and and maybe just to give a little bit of background, um, what we're talking about is transitioning from magnetic HID, right, predominantly, which is the light source in the, in these type of applications, uh, going over to LED. So a lot of these applications, it's the first time that they have an electronic power source in in these lighting fixtures that's connected to this power grid that has this massive heavy machinery, maybe it's a crane operating off of that uh, or, or big conveyor. So it's it's a pretty nasty environment. And the, I completely understand where the question is coming from because a lot of the failures that are deemed to be power quality uh, kind of happen in these applications, whether it's uh, drop neutral, uh, it could be voltage imbalances on the line, uh, causing you know more voltage applied on certain side versus the other. Uh, there's a lot of surges, which is coming from uh, heavy machinery switching in and out. Um, and, and really there haven't been good solutions deployed in the market to counter that. Um, and, and kind of thinking of magnetic HID, um, it was a very simple system, right? There was no electronics involved. Uh, electronics automatically makes things more susceptible uh, to transient type of events. Uh, so we actually, uh, as part of Signify or Advance, which is our LED driver brand, we're launching a product we call DuraVolt, and that's actually designed to be much more resilient for these power quality issues. And somebody might ask, hey, why, why now, right? 15 years later, uh, and I think it's, it's really taken us that 10 year, 12 year um, data on how lighting applications have evolved, how the where it's being used. Initially, we started with signage, then we kind of transitioned into general lighting, uh, more area lighting, outdoor kind of things. And now we're uh, entering the, the domain of magnetic HID, which to be honest, electronic fluorescent even didn't make its way into that application because it is such a severe and harsh application. So I think um, those kind of products will definitely change the game when it comes to reliability or uh, longevity of operation in, in these type of applications. So simple answer to the question is yes, we are uh, stepping up to the challenge and, and uh, you, you'll probably come across more uh, information about DuraVolt products in the future. Thanks, Amanda. One of uh, the, I'm assuming the person to asked the question, someone else had just replied uh, finally and thank you. So it's uh, definitely great news to hear from the LED industry. Absolutely. Thank you. In the meantime, you know, before 
your product comes out, I mean, uh, what, what are some of the best practices uh, fixture manufacturers to help supplant uh, and, you know, adjunct to the power supply? Yeah, no, and, and that's a good question. Uh, in, in the past, what we've tried is we've just said, hey, go upgrade your lighting grid, which um, it's, it's meant as a joke. <laughs> Nobody likes to hear that uh, because it's, it's just not practical, right? So if you think of the steel mill in the middle of Indiana, where, you know, it's 50 year, 100 year old lighting infrastructure or electrical infrastructure, they're not going to spend the money to upgrade their lighting grid just because they don't have an ungrounded uh, Y connection for the electrical system. Um, and, and that's kind of what we've come across. Um, so really the, the solution or maybe it's not, solution is not the right word. The, the way to improve the performance is to deploy surge protection at different levels. So you have a um, driver level surge protection. So what we do is we add six KV protection inbuilt within the driver. Then you have a fixture level protection. So you may have a surge pack external to the driver, but still a part of the fixture. And then there's panel level protection. So there's surge suppressors at the electrical panel. Uh, and, and using these chain or sequence of uh, measures, you're able to distribute the energy uh, and, and kind of protect the lighting ballast or, or driver in, in this case. Um, so those are some of the measures that are employed um, of course, if you get failures where you have a whole row of fixtures go out, that's typically what we call loss of neutral, where you lose a neutral connection and then 480 volt get apply, gets applied to 277 volt drivers. Um, in those kind of events, it's better to understand why the failure happened and, and maybe to try to mitigate the cause of that phenomenon. And adding on to the previous question, uh, someone else in the audience is asking, how do you handle brownout conditions? Yeah, I think that's, that's uh, something that we've looked at very, um, very deeply. So even as with electronic fluorescent lighting, we've seen brownout conditions or uh, occasional power, power uh, fluctuations. For example, I think it was in New York City where the lighting requires a 20% um, voltage dip the lighting, uh, uh, electrical lighting should be able to handle a 20% voltage dip because every evening when the city turns on, it's, it's the building lights, you get a momentary dip until more uh, relays are kicked in to provide the voltage. And um, we do pretty significant brownout testing. So we uh, try different durations, different depth dips uh, to make sure that the lighting doesn't fail, but also it doesn't get locked up in some weird operation mode, which could also be equally bad because now you have to go find the circuit breaker and, and reset the circuit. So uh, that, that's a pretty important uh, factor. And then lastly, maybe um, it it's sounds obvious, but also a lot of the A brand products, uh, they go through a lot more engineering and, and testing behind making sure that these kind of events are handled as opposed to a lot of the imports and, and stuff that comes from overseas. Uh, so it's also good to understand what drivers you're using in the fixtures and so on. Follow up comment on that is that uh, noting 20% may be too low a threshold if three phase system loses a leg. Yep, yep. And, and that's uh, precisely the reference to the loss of neutral that we uh, uh, kind of talked about. So you basically have a 480 volt system and then you have a 277 to neutral. Um, as, as soon as you lose the 277 volt neutral, you get 480 volts applied across two 277 volt fixtures. And, and what tends to happen which is very interesting because LED power, LED drivers are what we call a constant power supply. So if you apply more voltage, they draw less current. If you apply less voltage, they draw more current, but they try to maintain a constant power. So essentially the balancing of the two voltages ends up being uh, putting a lot of voltage on one driver and a very little voltage on the other one. Uh, and, and they find some way of operating there until one of them blows up. Um, so that's kind of what happens with these loss of neutral scenarios. Great, thank you, man. And thank you, Mike, for the questions as well. Yep, thank you. Okay, um, next question. Oops. 
I can do that in a sec. Um, is there a reasonable alternative to full cutoff lighting for outdoor and will IES support it? Um, there's a subset to that. The use of IES's TM15-11 bug or backlight, uplight, and glare classification of outdoor lighting fixtures to ensure that only well-shielded fixtures are used. used sorry. Uh, no uplight for area and street lighting is allowed in any zone. And we put the link to that uh, from the Dark Skies organization right up on your chat button there too. So back to you, I guess, Brianne, we'll start with you. Um, sure. So um, this is a great question and probably could be a webinar in and of itself. So I will say um, a couple quick things about where the IES is right now. Um, we, in April, we released uh, an announcement of a collaboration um, between the International Dark Sky Association and IES, which had not happened in the past. I mean, they were, the model lighting ordinance is the one exception, but they were kind of working um, in parallel, but we now, have announced a collaboration and I think that that, in fact, I will, uh, I can put that link in here too. Um, so I would, you know, head there and you can learn a little bit more about what's happening between the two organizations. Um, and this is one of the reasons uh, among other lighting quality concerns and some other things where the IES work and the volunteers that are so important to all of us um, and the IDA work weren't always, didn't always see eye to eye. Um, that being said, and you'll see in the press release that, you know, we're seeing about a 2% increase in light pollution per year. Um, and I'm going to, I would like to see how that compares to the adoption of LED and what's happening in the, in the crossover there. Um, as people put more LED in, I think that issue actually is getting worse. But the five principles that the, you know, the quality outdoor lighting aspect is to, at least the operating principles that we're working on are color um, controls or controlled, um, the light level, uh, and that light is targeted and useful. And up light for a long time has been a big source of debate in terms of what whether it is useful or not. Um, so hopefully we'll see some some new standards. Um, this particular the the bug rating and the MLO needs an update, and that's a commitment that they have made as a part of the strategic collaboration. So 2011 was a long time ago, and I think it was reactionary to what was happening in the LED realm, although I think it has a lot of good information. So as far as the IES is concerned, I'm curious to see how this collaboration and the update to the MLO shifts where we're headed. This is uh, Tom. I'm just going to jump in there, and I, I, it's my job to be the guy who hates everything that's cookie cutter uh, on the on the board. So um, I've never been a fan of IDA, and uh, and I, I despise the model lighting ordinance as a as the concept that it's a model lighting ordinance, and yet the terminology in it is prescriptive. It's not selective, and and one of my complaints there is you. If they want to print one out that makes it life really easy on, on a governmental organization to put in a lighting ordinance, then give them the choices and tell them what the pros and cons are. Uh, I live in Charlevoix, Michigan. The town next door is Petoskey, Michigan. It's a cute little town. It's got a little downtown district called the Gaslight District, which is literally gas lights. Well, that wouldn't meet the requirement of no uplight in uh, area and street lighting. So that town needs to know enough to say, yeah, okay, we like, we want to put some kind of lighting ordinance in, but we don't want to lose our historic parts. So now they're going to define out micro zones within their area that, that don't do that. And, and if the MLO was structured such that it, uh, it gave people choices and said, hey, by the way, when you do this, uh, when, you, when you prescribe this in a park, maybe you're a, a city that's got 50 parks, you're not going to be lighting the foliage. You're, um, you're not going to light historic building facades. You know, those are the things that you're going to give up when you do this. So, um, I, you know, like, as Brianne said, this could be a subject for, a, uh, for its own webinar, and I, I, could, uh, I could talk for an hour about all the things I can't stand about IDA and the MLO, but uh, I think it's, 
I'm glad to see the IES getting involved more with it. And I hope that the outcome of that is that again, we put more responsibility on the lighting designers and people who know what they're doing with this rather than come out with some standardized form that everybody has to conform to. I think that's poor lighting. And uh, I think we can do a great job of controlling sky glow without being prescriptive and saying you can't have any up light. Yeah, again, I mean, as a, as a former lighting designer, Tom, I can't, can't tell you how many times I have put light straight up a facade um, for purposes of perception of safety, depth perception, highlighting architecture, a lot of the things that Europe is really good at embracing and we've been quick to kind of turn all the lights downward and then, and then call it good. So um, our hopes are similar, that there's a little bit more nuance to it moving forward. I think, uh, you know, over the last couple of years at a lot of the IES conferences and elsewhere, there's been a lot of discussion about uh, full cutoff and sky glow and whether requiring all these area lights and street lights to be full cutoff has really helped the sky glow situation. Um, there's a, a lot of people that have pointed out, you know, if you, if you actually do a flyover of a particular city that's been retrofitted with uh, full cutoff LED fixtures, the reflected light off of the pavement is actually worse than the lumens that were being thrown up in the sky in the first place. So you haven't really fixed sky glow. So what are we really talking about here? Um, it, it is more energy efficient to, I guess, try to point as much light to the ground as possible where you need it. But if we're talking about dark skies, I'm not sure that uh, we've accomplished that with all these full cutoff fixtures. Sure. And just to add on your comment, Brian, where you said, uh, rather than addressing some of the nuances in Europe, we just turn the lights down and called it good. Actually, what we've done is turn the lights down, ramped up the efficacy, and then called it good. And that, of course, is the byproduct. Yeah, I mean, there's all sorts of issues with full cutoff, not the least of which is that your uniformity, in order to achieve a certain uniformity, you have a challenge on your hands. So I don't, to Tom's point, I don't think, and I've been to Petoskey a number of times. I don't think a one size fits all solution is the right thing to do. I think, you know, we have a familiarity with the way that light behaves on our tiny little town facades and things like that. But there's also a time and a place for that, right? I mean, we still deserve dark sky parks and, and other things where there's some preservation or balance of us not encroaching on flora and fauna and, 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 you know, recognizing or respecting that that there's a risk in, in doing that. We've seen it in crop changes. We've seen it in bird patterns and fish patterns and a variety of other things. I'll spare you. But um, I, I think that there's a, a better balance to be achieved and hopefully that the IES can, can help. The volunteers of the IES, of course. And just to add on to that, Brianne, I think that it, knowing some of the, peop the good people over at the IDA, um, I think they're very interested in working with IES to come up with a better solution. You know, I mean, and like you said, and I understand where Tom is coming from. I understand where what Don is saying too, and that is that, uh, you know, by trial and error so far, we might not be accomplishing what we've been trying to do, you know, the whole way. And so I think by the collaboration now with IES and that you guys are working together, I think there's going to be a maybe a, a lot that organization and your organization will come to a lot more of a, um, you know, a, a neutral space where, where sky glow can really be addressed, period. So, okay, got the next question. We're gonna head over to the next question. This will be directed at Tom, although there may be some interface for Corey to interact too. And the question asked is, how long will acrylic optics last in an outdoor application, Tom? Yeah, thanks, Michael. I think, uh, I think there's always a lot of confusion over uh, lumping in acrylics and polycarbonates together and just calling them all plastics. And, and sometimes those, uh, depending on how they're applied, get a really bad reputation in the, uh, in the market. You see a lot of yellowed globes out there in the, in the field and a lot of yellowed optics and wall packs, especially over the years back when the HID wall packs would um, could have a very short life. I mean, inside of a car wash, we'd see wall packs go yellow within six weeks. Uh, LEDs have had a dramatic uh, impact on what's happened there because there's nowhere near the directed energy uh, hitting, the, uh, hitting the plastic. Um, 
the other thing we've seen is that, that we don't really need polycarbonate unless you're into a real vandal resistant application. And polycarbonate is the, is the plastic that's most commonly used out there that you see turning yellow. So um, acrylic, we can expect to see lifetimes of uh, 20 years plus out there now. Um, we like to know in advance what the application is gonna be. Uh, we frequently offer a 10 year warranty, but we've, uh, we have worked with companies in the past who once you describe what the fixture is and how it's gonna be used in the application that, that will extend warranties out there 20 years. Um, we've got a long history of parts. You can still see a lot of parts in the field that we've installed that have been out there 30, 40 years. And other than the fact they got kind of dirty, uh, that, uh, that, that still are doing a great job of functioning. Uh, I was, uh, I grew up in Ann Arbor. I get down there fairly often and, and uh, the uh, kind of like the, the premier restaurant, I think there is the Gandhi Dancer down, downtown. Uh, Lumicon lit that with the Ring of Fire, how many years ago? Probably about seven, I think, maybe eight. Uh, about seven, eight years ago. I was down there about two years ago. And somebody must be cleaning them because it looks brand new. I mean, the, uh, those, uh, the optics there look just fantastic. So there really is no discoloration going on. I would say that today when you're appropriately specifying optics and things that, that um, uh, I think will be the guys uh, lasting out there at least as long as the new and better drivers that are coming along. My short answer for that. Great. I pay a lot of taxes here in Ann Arbor, Tom. Somebody better be cleaning those lights. Right on. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> um, we're going to pivot to a question that came in on the chat box. Um, it's from Patricia, and she says, uh, due to the, pa the pandemic, do you see more customers requesting more American-made products uh, moving away from China products? Uh, short answer, because Lumicon is American made, yes, Patricia, yes. Absolutely. No, but let's, let's let somebody else answer. I don't, I don't know that anybody is insisting on it right now, specifically due to COVID or the pandemic. Um, I can tell you on the manufacturing side of things, we've been uh, domestically sourcing as much as we can uh, as a strategy, as an overall strategy. Uh, with with a special focus in the last couple of years. And that's for economic and lead time issues and all kinds of other issues besides uh, a global pandemic. Um, you know, and especially let's focus on like die castings for a moment. So previously, uh, you know, a lot of companies will get their die cast housings made in China, uh, including Lumicon. We, we've had some made in China in the past. And the downside to, to that strategy is uh, exceptionally long lead time. So if I want uh, to order a, a new batch of housings, first of all, I have to fill a shipping container. Um, so depending on what housing we're talking about, uh, that could be 500 housings, it could be 3000 housings. So uh, you're not gonna ship a partial container, you're gonna ship a full one. So there's a huge financial commitment, it ties up a ton of cash, and I'm gonna have to wait maybe eight weeks, maybe 10 weeks to get that product on my doorstep. And I haven't even sold it yet. So uh, the last couple of years, we've been uh, tooling more and more products uh, locally. Our new Detroit series line of product, uh, all of those castings are made in Muskegon, Michigan. And the bonus, one of the huge bonuses to that is the piece cost is not much different from China, believe it or not. Um, I can order 100 pieces if I want, and I can get them in the next couple of weeks when I order them. So as, a, as an overall sourcing strategy, it makes a ton of sense for us to locally source as much as we can. Uh, there's certain things that that's just not going to happen anytime soon. Uh, LEDs are always going to be made in China or in Asia for the most part, uh, from what I can see. Um, you know, power supplies, uh, we, we see more and more of those moving to places like Mexico and a little bit closer to home. Uh, and that's a good thing. As far as those being made in the US, that's probably not gonna happen anytime soon either. But, you know, our customers, there is a certain segment of them that, you know, they, they want to buy US made product. Um, and in certain situations like federal government, uh, it's a requirement. So uh, certainly there's a, a uh, certain contingent that are asking for U.S. Uh, content. 
Yeah, commenting from the LED side, I think I mentioned this during our last uh, get together, is that, yeah, a lot of the LEDs are made in China and the remaining ones are made in Asia. So because of the pandemic, the drive to move from a non-China supply uh, base hasn't been accelerated. It's been usually because of, as Don mentioned, either it's your company strategy to be U.S. made or you refuse or don't want to pay the tariff when the tariffs went to, into effect. So to that point, we have moved some of our high running LEDs to either Vietnam or Korea production, primarily again, to avoid the tariff. Um, and we'll probably continue that migration over time, but there are some LEDs that are just so low cost that moving them to a non-China manufacturing location really won't make any sense. So, um, so again, so, so some of the larger runners will be moving to, you know, those non-China locations. Um, I have a question for Amea. Uh, as far as drivers and being made in Mexico, is there any other reason other than maybe labor costs that they're not being manufactured in the United States? Um, pretty much, uh, I think the labor costs for, uh, and, and also the volume, right? So the capacity to produce at the scale that we produce in Mexico. Um, at, at that capacity, the cost is incredibly high uh, because we don't have the base, manufacturing base in, in the US for that. Uh, but besides that, uh, no, there's no other reason for not producing it here. Okay. Uh, Corey, we talked about this last time too, and that is that, you know, by moving, I know China's been manufacturing for many years. The skill level uh, is, it's pretty high in China, let's say. Uh, are you seeing that same skill level in places like Vietnam and Korea, or is it, um, or is there gonna be some growing pains if you move over to those areas? I think you know, the LED manufacturing process is very similar to the semiconductor manufacturing processes in company, countries like Vietnam, like Korea, Malaysia, Philippines, do have a really strong semiconductor base. So. The transitions we've seen from moving to China to any of those other locations has actually been pretty smooth, pretty flawless so far. So, so hopefully it'll continue down that path, but, but to date, everything's been, been, been going really well. And Tom, as an American manufacturer, do you see any benefit to you for going overseas or staying right where you're at? No, we, we, I don't think we'll be going overseas for anything. We certainly, we have plants in uh, Charlevoix, Michigan, Dixon, Tennessee, and we have a plant in Monterey, Mexico. So our version of overseas is Monterey. Um, you know, we're, we certainly have a, uh, a footprint that is growing there because a lot of the North American lighting fixture production capacity has moved into Mexico. So we're uh, like everybody else, we have to follow where the, uh, where the customers are. So we've, we've certainly got that aspect of it, but I don't see anything else we're pulling back more and more from the things, from the limited number of things we have sourced from Asia. Okay. All right, Michael. All right, we're gonna head over to the next question and this is going to be directed at Corey. Uh, this is for organic LEDs. Corey, can you touch on copper OLEDs? Sure, I can, that's a short discussion because it's such a new, uh, new technology. Um, standard OLEDs uh, are about 25% uh, efficient uh, in the quantum realm. Um, manufacturers such as Samsung, we use, we use LEDs exclusively actually in our televisions now. Um, we're working to try to get that up to closer to 100%. And in order to do that, currently you have to use some pretty precious metals like iridium and platinum to get that 100% quantum efficiency. These new developments that came out of Europe about a month or so ago uh, on copper gets that quantum efficiency up to about 100%, but using copper, using a very an abundant element. So it's very interesting uh, technology um, and a possibility, but it's unfortunately, it's several years away from being um, commercialized to, to any degree. Um, in general, you know, there's not a lot of players in the, in the OLED space. It's just such a small market, but perhaps if you can get that quantum efficiency up to 100%, make it scalable, 
maybe somebody, some, a larger company may jump into the fray, but again, that's probably a couple years out before it's commercially viable and available. Um, next question is, do you think there'll be, uh, sorry, do you think there will be an LED removable sources as the output and, opt and optics improve? So um, I think what they're trying to say here is that, uh, are you going to see more fixtures have removable LED panels and optics and become upgradable as LEDs improve and as optics improve? And I think we're going to throw this one at Don. Well, um, I think that's been a, a strategy for some manufacturers for a while. I'm seeing more and more products that are, uh, you know, I, I think what we're talking about is replaceable sources here. So you basically pop out one board and put another one in. I, um, I think, uh, yeah, that's that's going to continue to happen. I mean, if something goes wrong with the LED board, to be able to replace it in the field is um, is uh, certainly helpful. Um, I would say though that the the instance of the LED source itself actually failing, or the even the PCB board itself being a source of failure needing replacement, um, it's pretty low. Generally, from a maintenance standpoint, if there's a component that that's going to need field replacement. It's usually the power supply or a surge suppressor if it's there. That's still the, uh, uh, the, the I won't call it infancy failure, but it, it's still the first component to fail um, in most situations. But, uh, you know, generally the LEDs themselves last so long that I think by the time, you know, you're ready to look at upgrading the LEDs to the next generation, it's, a lot of times it's just easier to swap out the fixture and uh, you're probably ready for a new fixture anyway. So I don't know if anyone else has thoughts on that. I'll just jump in and say, I kind of wish that, that it could happen to some extent and that, uh, you know, it, it feels like what's going to happen is every, what, seven years now we'll be ripping fixtures out of every ceiling and putting new ones in because either to Don's point, Either the efficacy is no longer competitive and it's time to upgrade that way, but you're going to swap out the entire fixture and it seems like a lot of waste there. In the past, we new technology light bulbs came out and you just took out the T12 and put in a T8 and then you put in a T5 and, and upgraded your drivers and you didn't have to take out the entire fixture. So it is probably a, a bigger waste stream coming all of our way um, when when we're swapping out entire fixtures as opposed to just light bulbs. I think everything is kind of designed to be a system now though too. That's, that's another issue. It's, it's not like you're considering the housing independent of the LEDs and drivers. You're designing everything to operate together, you know, and the housing is a heat sink. And so if that makes swapping out LEDs a little more problematic than it would be in back in the lamp days uh, for fixtures. So, um, I think some of the benefits of, of just being able to swap out the LEDs, uh, there certainly are some, but you're still paying a contractor to go up there and open up a fixture and, and touch wiring and components and everything else. And from that standpoint, uh, I think a lot of end users just think it's, it's faster and more economical just to swap the fixture out. Yeah, from a residential perspective, um, I did a lot of high-end homes toward the end of working as a designer that were integral LED. And um, it was a really steep, strong learning curve or education moment for us with a homeowner because homeowners aren't used to a turnover of technology like a commercial owner might be, right? We, we are used to replacing everybody's laptops every five years or whatever it might be. The cycle of things is a little different in residential. And so, um, you know, you sell a homeowner a hundred integral LED downlights and, uh, that's a really, really big ask because it's not necessarily just an electrician. You may have a drywall guy too. So um, form factor changes or something else changes and you rip down the whole housing or the housing's not accessible, you actually have to have it patched and painted and then re, and so there's, there's a lot of layers of labor that would previously be kind of uh, moot really. 
so we, we've taken away some of the freedom that homeowners had to take care of that but that's mostly on the really really high-end residential market right i mean people are still using screw in a19s for <laughs> for other residences for sure so if you look at how some of the even the led packages themselves have changed over the years uh you know what we as a company initially started producing LED fixtures, you needed this massive heat sink and huge PCBs with these big gangly LEDs on them to, to produce 900 lumens. And, and now you can do the same thing with, uh, with a flashlight. And so the whole form factor kind of shrinks as time goes on. And, and you know, this discussion of uh, OLED, uh, who knows what's gonna happen in the next 10, 12 years as far as LED form factors go. So. Uh, it's hard, hard to predict, uh, you know, as a company, do you really want to uh, design around replacing LEDs when there, there could be so much more done um, from a full fixture system standpoint? Yeah, it's, it's also quite interesting, uh, just anecdotally, anecdotally, right? I, I ran into one of the uh, executives at Walgreens at, at one of the conferences, and we were just talking about LEDs and if efficacy. And he's like, these LEDs that we have are so inefficient. They're so low lumen per watt. I said, what are you talking about? He's like, they're like 60 lumens per watt. I said, how can that be? How, how old are these? Uh, don't you guys have any uh, refurbishment cycles or, uh, amort, you know, don't you put money aside for that? He said, yeah, we do that. But then five years later, um, you know, the bean cutter, uh, counters look at that and say, hey, uh, this money is better utilized buying something else than upgrading the lighting. And then you kind of move into the next cycle after that. So it's actually quite funny how, uh, hey, it's still working. Why, why should we change it? Kind of an attitude. <laughs> yeah, you used to see, um, you know, like Don was saying, the first lights that came out were huge because of the heat sinks. Then you saw a real movement to shrink the format of the of the light as much as you could. And now you're seeing uh, fixtures start to grow again because now they have to incorporate surge suppression, onboard controls, uh, occupancy sensors, you know, they need more room inside of the, uh, of the cavity. And so um, now they're starting to take the place of all the things that you used to hang on a pole, like cameras, uh, you know, vehicle counters, so on and so forth and fixture manufacturers are starting to incorporate all of the above into, into fixtures. So now you're seeing them grow again uh, to accommodate that, so. Yeah, and it would, it would have to take some shift in UL listing and warranty too, to replace anything in the field, right? I mean, just in terms of what you can expect a manufacturer to stand behind if you did some in-field work on that luminaire and especially opening it up in, in the field, if it's outdoor lighting, creates a whole host of other other issues and compromises too. So there there's quite a risk there. That's true. And then whoever's selling the new replacement, if it's not the original manufacturer, then is it going to be compatible with the drivers, the Billy Amp drives match up? There's all kinds of, uh, of calamity that could happen for sure. I sense a, a new business opportunity here in refurbishing or rebuilding fixtures maybe and figuring that out. So uh, certainly from a green standpoint, that sounds like an attractive uh, thing to pursue. We, we do a ton of that kind of work too, actually. So, yeah. True, very true. Thank you, Alyssa. Yes, we do do that. So, um, <clears throat> Is there any final questions from uh, our viewership out there? Um, we're about to wrap up. So I just wanna make sure there's no other final questions. Okay. Well, uh, yes, you can get a copy of the presentation. So uh, in our, in, in summation, uh, we did record this session. We are going to uh, post it probably either later today or sometime tomorrow morning onto our website and also YouTube uh, so that you can pass it around and review it. Um, and with that said, uh, there's also a copy of the, um, of the uh, chat section as well will be available. But uh, I would like to thank uh, Brianne. Maya, Corey, Tom, Don, and Michael, thank you very much for everyone's participation today. 
I think we've had another great conversation and uh, I'm sure in a couple months we'll probably try to put together another one of these. Uh, a little shout out for next week. We are going to have um, uh, Mark Lyon uh, from uh, IES is going to be talking about GUV and, and UV lighting for an hour. Um, those uh, invites will be going out probably tomorrow. Um, and and uh, so if you have a more of an interest to even learn more about UV, um, he gives an excellent presentation. Uh, Brian, you can, uh, you know, uh, throw in. Yes, he does. <laughs> so, so Mark's very uh, highly educated um, and is very well versed on the subject. And we're going to condense the four hour one down into about an hour if we can and, and talk about the highlights. And um, Mark's not a bad guy either. He's from Michigan, so we kind of really like him too. So uh, other than that, um, that's it for now. So thank you, everybody. And uh, have a safe and uh, happy holiday this weekend. Yeah. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, thanks, everybody.